I think there's nowhere in the world where the crisis of capitalism is more uh, openly obvious and, uh, and, and deep as is revealed in, in, the, in, in the Middle East. You have this area which is the cradle of civilization, basically, where humanity took its first steps kind of out of barbarism. And it's, uh, it's a, you know, several proud peoples living there with long cultures, uh, many cultural treasures. And yet, every single day, this whole heritage is being undermined and crushed, and the whole area is being dragged into barbarism. Uh, and daily, you know, the peoples of the area are daily humiliated by different imperialist powers and their puppets who roam around in, in, in the region without giving a damn, basically, about the future of developing those societies and the future of those peoples. Uh, now, that's been the the kind of fate of the Middle East for at least the past hundred years under capitalism, that the masses have been more or less, uh, well, well, the masses have been dominated and oppressed more or less at all times by different imperialist forces. Uh, but with the Arab Revolution, we saw for the first time in many years a fight back against that. You saw the Arab masses that we are told every single day in the media are these backward, medieval-seeking, uh, you know, very deeply religious and conservative people coming out and fighting for their own, for their rights and for a democratic society and for basically taking control over their own, um, their own destinies. And in fact, it was, more than anything, it was a fight back against, the, against capitalism, against the expression of capitalism in the Middle East, Middle East against exploitation, oppression, backwardness, and all these things that the capitalism has been perpetuating throughout the region. Um, in Egypt and Tunisia, in particular, where the revolution kind of advanced the most, you had this incredible situation with, where millions of people without any organization, any plan, any leadership, any idea of what, where they were going or really what they were doing, overthrew these monstrous state machineries within a matter of days and weeks. Uh, especially in, in Egypt, you had not just one revolution in 2011, you had, in fact, something between five and six uprisings from 2011 until 2014, with the biggest one being the multi-million man march in, in, in uh, Cairo, especially in, uh, at the end of June in 2013, where al-Sisi came to power. But even after that, a lot of people forget or maybe haven't heard about it, but even Sisi's first government, the Biblavi government, was overthrown by a mass movement of workers in the February just after he got into power. And that was just a few months after he'd been raised to this you know, status of pop star, almighty God, and you know, politician in general all mixed into one, this, this Bonaparte who kind of appeared to be standing above society. And even his... A uh, star began to fade immediately because he couldn't satisfy, obviously, the basic needs of the people. He couldn't change the fact that he represented a capitalist system, which was the reason for the dead end and which is the reason for the dead end throughout the region, of, so of society throughout the region. But uh, however magnificent these revolutions were, they made two major mistakes. They left, well, one major mistake, which is they left power in the hands of the old ruling class. They removed one ruler, like the, they ruled Ben Ali or Mubarak or Mohammed Morsi, but the state apparatus and the economy, which is the, the two main levers of power in society, remained in the hands of, this, of the same old people. And nothing was, was essentially changed. And that's why you hear a lot of people, you, if you walk around in Egypt, talk to people, say, what, what did the revolution do? They would say, well, everything changed, but nothing changed. And that's literally what a lot of people would say, because the fundamental basis of society... Uh, remained the same. Um, and that was the, that was the big mistake of those revolutions because they weren't prepared for what was to come, and especially the leaders of those revolutions, the people who were kind of catapulted into the leadership of those re revolutions, didn't understand what are the fundamental problems we're dealing with. It's not just one evil person. It's a system which is incapable of the developing society and which is causing all this misery uh, and pain on, on, on the people. And that's why they're rebelling. Um, 
Nevertheless, I, I, I'll get back to that, but nothing is finished, even in, not, not in Tunisia, where there's still protests going on on an almost daily basis. And also in Egypt, although the people are tired, there's still a mad, very angry mood, and people know that they brought down all those governments. But at the moment, they're a bit disoriented and maybe, maybe a bit tired, but nothing has been solved, in effect. Now, Syria was the weak link of the Arab Revolution, together with Libya, maybe you can say. I'm not going to talk about Libya, but it's very similar to the general process. It's very similar to, 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 to Syria. Now, if it hadn't been because of the Arab Revolution, there probably wouldn't have been a revolution in Syria for a number of years to come. And the reason for this is that in the 70s, uh, especially during a very tumultuous, uh, 60s, sorry, a tumultuous period and revolutionary period in the Middle East, you had through a series of coups, of revolutionary coups and counter coups within Syria, you, you basically ended up in a situation where a layer of the army bureaucracy or army uh, establishment took power and expropriated uh, the, the, capital, the Syrian capitalists and landlords and effectually set up a system, a planned economy kind of based on, on Stalinist Russia. So, of course, no, no democra- democracy whatsoever, but nevertheless, a, a planned economy which didn't rule, which didn't function according to capitalist market laws. And that allowed Syrian economy to, and Syrian society to, to develop to a very high uh, degree. In fact, before the war, Syria was one of the most developed areas of the whole Middle East. You had free education, free health care. More or less everyone you know, had a job. that were, Unemployment was far, far less than, than the rest of the, the region. And of course, all of these things had begun to kind of be uh, uh, reversed, especially with the decline of Soviet Union or the fall of the Soviet Union. There was kind of a, the Chinese path that the, that, that the Assad regime was taking and they were introducing capitalism and, and privatizing and so on. But the process hadn't reached that far, and therefore the regime had a certain base, especially within the cities, uh, amongst the state bureaucracy, and amongst the working class, although they weren't necessarily or aren't supporters of the regime, but looking around themselves in the region, which is you know, chaos, misery, poverty, and, and the general state uh, uh, that, that we know, well, they didn't see any alternative in that. And... Um, and therefore, when the revolution came, just bringing out these, these young people uh, who were mainly, in fact, uh, peasants or you know, people who had been migrating internally, internally displaced peasants, mainly a rural population, who had been hit hardest by the privatization uh, programs of, of the Assad regime, when they took to the streets, um, they didn't appeal and bring, bring forward dem- democratic demands. Of course, a lot of people sympathized with them, but they couldn't attract them to the streets on a, in a revolutionary way. Something bigger was needed. Uh, and a lot of Syrian workers would say, well, yeah, we're for democracy, but what kind of democracy? Uh, democracy like in Turkey or Iraq? Is that the kind of democracy that, that, that you want from us? And therefore, they, couldn't, they didn't join the movement. In fact, throughout the period where it was still a revolution, there wasn't a single strike in Syria. There wasn't a single real worker strike. Lots of Bazari strikes, I, sorry, um, like uh, traders striking and so on, people taking to the streets. But wor- the working class as a whole didn't really move and didn't participate in the movement. And the movement was confined to the youth and to the rural areas and to the rural population who had been, who'd been moved recently uh, to the cities because of uh, a drought which was also taking place there. Now, um, seeing a dead end and stalemate in the situation... The, the, the leaders of the movement, that although they made many things, in, in many ways they were ahead of the movement in, in Egypt and in Tunisia because they were better organized, they had committees and councils in every single neighborhood, they had defense committees who were linked up to these councils, very advanced on an organizational level, but politically they were weak. But seeing the stalemate, they saw, well, uh, what's happening in Libya? And in Libya you saw the West intervening and supporting, well, intervening militarily and overthrowing Gaddafi. They thought, well, this is great, this is exactly what, what we need. And they started calling for uh, Western intervention. So that basically further divided or, or increased the d- divide between them and the broader layers of the urban masses and the working class, which were the key layers who brought down Mubarak in Egypt and also Ben Ali in, in, in Tunisia. They didn't bring along the, the, the working class. And, and the, this idea of appealing to the West just played into the hands of Assad, who could say, look at what I said. 
this is all a conspiracy by the West against me. And therefore, in fact, Assad was strengthened. A layer, some layers moved away from the, from the revolutionary camp or became more passive. Um, and, and some layers even went in support of the Assad regime because of this. And therefore, you had a, you had a, 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 a stalemate. Um, and, and Assad uh, uh, tried also to push the movement towards a civil war situation, i.e. increasing the crackdown, military, trying to get a military uh, clash, again, to dilute the political element uh, 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 of the movement. And the movement bit on it, basically. Because of its inexperience, it, bit, so it, it kind of uh, went for this and moved towards a, a civil war, a, basically, yeah, civil war situation. Now, a civil war, as Marxists, we're not against civil war or armed warfare, armed revolutionary warfare. But the point is, in, in revolutions, the armed struggle can only be an auxiliary force. Uh, why? Because the state will always be better prepared. They have tanks, air, you know, an air force, uh, heavy artillery, heavy weapons. They have a you know, system of command and control and so on. They're much, much more, more better organized, whereas the revolution can only, at best, have light, you know, semi-light, uh, semi-heavy uh, uh, weapons and no organization, no structures and all these things. It has to, it has to make them up. So obviously, it, it has to rely on the political program. Uh, and if it doesn't have this political program to appeal to break the, 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 the opposing army on class lines, then what? Then it and it only relies on on purely armed warfare. Then it opens itself up to influence from outside. Because what does an army need if it's just on a military po- uh, basis? It needs arms. It needs money. It needs food. It needs basically to sustain this army. It needs sponsors. Money that a revolution normally doesn't have as it, when, it, when, it's, when, it's, when it's moving ahead. And that opened up uh, an avenue for the West basically to intervene. And you saw billions and billions of dollars coming from uh, the U.S., European uh, uh, powers, uh, Turkey, Qatar, you know, the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan, trying for, for two main reasons. On the one hand, they wanted to build up a movement against Assad, who is was an ally of Iran, and they wanted to weaken the influence of Iran in, in the region. But even more importantly, in order to cut across the Arab Revolution and create a scarecrow to, to, to show everyone and see this is what happens if you rebel. And that's exactly, if you, if you talk with many millions of people around the, the Middle East, at least until recently, they would say, well, thank God, like in Morocco, some of our friends would say, oh, thank God we're not, we didn't go as far as Syria because we don't want to end up like that. Um, but the West thought that this would be a quick thing. They would come in, they would support these groups who were n- nothing moderate at all, first of all. They were complete, they were, they were, it was jihadi, Islamic fundamentalist groups, basically. Um, and um, they, they would support these, and then quickly they would overthrow Assad like they had done Gaddafi, and then they would just wrap up all these Islamists and so on. But the, but the problem was that because the, the movement became more radical, more sectarian, Assad was strengthened even more politically. And you saw that it was impossible for, for, the, for the movement to gain influence in a whole series of, of areas. And in the meantime, this movement was becoming more and more radicalized. You had the rise of ISIS, which came out of other groups that, they, that, that the West had supported, basically. And it became a threat to the interest, a destabilizing factor, even from a capitalist, imperialist point of view. And you saw the U.S. basically shifting, trying to move away from this, being afraid of the, this Frankenstein monster that is caused. But on the other hand, it had Saudi Arabia and Turkey and all these other forces which had invested in, in this and couldn't just move away because that would mean a massive defeat for them in, in the whole region. Um, in, in Iraq, in fact, the U.S. went so far as to having to lean, well, until today, lean on Iranian supporters, Shia militias. And even in, inside Syria, it was de facto kind of accepting an Assad victory. And in fact, Obama was to a certain degree favoring a victory for, for Assad. Now, what does this, this reveal? This reveals a different process, which is also very important at this stage, uh, which is the crisis of U.S. imperialism, that, that the U.S., uh, as an imperialist force, is not able to maneuver as it used to in the previous periods. And the reason for these are, 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 are numerous. Well, the first one is that after the defeats in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, which cost the, uh, not only you know, thousands of lives, but also trillions of dollars of debt uh, uh, 
and a very demoralizing, you know, general situation within the army and an extreme war wariness of, uh, uh, amongst the, the U.S. population, there is a political uh, obstacle into moving toward it. The, the ruling class does not want to do this. We saw with the Iraq war, there were millions of people on the streets on a worldwide basis. But today, with the deepening crisis, rising unemployment, and social crisis in the U.S., that would be nothing compared to what you would see within a very short period of time after the U.S. engaging on a new military adventure. In fact, they did try to bomb Syria, but they couldn't pass the vote uh, through, through, through Congress. At the same time, there's a deep economic crisis. I think the U.S. public debt stands at $20 trillion, something that is, you know, is just fantastic figures, basically. Um, which, again, means there's a limit to how, how much more debt it can take, or uh, you know, basically it cannot sustain uh, its own economy if it goes into that. And, at the same t- and, and then there's the, the social crisis, which is also connected to the economic crisis, the general economic crisis, to the state's economic crisis. There's a growing, a rising inequality, dissatisfaction. You saw this reflected with the popularity of Bernie Sanders and even with the popularity of Trump amongst lots of you know, millions of Americans who hate the establishment, who, who hate the rich, who hate the millionaires and billionaires. And out of all of this, you have a political crisis, which, which paralyzes the situation. There's an open civil war going on within the Republican Party, within the Democratic Party, and then amongst these two as well. So you have, you have this deep, deep crisis, which basically encompasses the whole uh, U.S. Uh, establishment, and which doesn't allow it to intervene as it used to in the past on a, on a world scale. Um, and at the same time, the, 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 the war in Iraq, which destroyed the Saddam Hussein's army, also opened up a vacuum for Iran as the, 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 you know, the, one of the most powerful armies in, in the region to kind of step into. Before that, Saddam's army and Ira- the Iranian army kind of held each other in check, and that allowed the U.S. and its, and its proxies to rule the Middle East. But with Saddam's army gone and nothing really to replace it, Iran, Iran could immediately step in gain influence, and become the rising military force of, 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 of the region, basically. Um, so you have this situation where there's a crisis of, U- of U.S. imperialism. There's the rise of Iran, which threaten, threatens not only U.S. interests in the Middle East, but also the interests of its proxies. And, and uh, although Iran couldn't match up with, basically, defeat the U.S. intervention in Syria... The, there was still this vacuum, and that's what, what happened when Russia s- stepped in, basically trying to fill out this vacuum and tip the balance to the other side. And that meant that in Syria, effectively, the U.S. was defeated, received one of its you know, most significant defeats in newer time, uh, which was signified in the Battle of Aleppo. I don't know if you remember, it was about a, a year ago, is it, already? <laughs> it seems longer, but it's, but it's only a year ago. Where you had U.S. troops and, and forces stationed literally down the road, and um, Russian, Iranian, and, and Syrian forces basically destroying U.S. proxies right in front of it with the U.S. being in- incapable of intervening. And that showed the, the limitations that U.S. imperialism faces at this stage. And it also showed that, obviously, the world order that the U.S. imperialism built for itself in the post-war period is not conceivable uh, as it was. It doesn't mean that the U.S. imperialism is, is finished or that the U.S. is not the strongest power on the planet. There's no other power anywhere near as strong as the U.S., but it's not necessarily the strongest force in every area of the region. And it's not necess- it cannot necessarily maneuver as easily, cannot just wade into a country as it did, for instance, with Afghanistan or, 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 or with Iraq. Um, and again, this breakup of the old kind of world order is reflected deep, most deeply in the Middle East, and especially in Saudi Arabia, which is maybe the weakest link of all the regimes of, of, of the region. Now, the Saudi regime has been desperately trying to roll back time, basically, to when it used to be more or less omnipotent in the Arab world, to the time before the economic, world economic crisis, to the time before the Arab Revolution, um, and before the Iraq war, basically, where Ira- Iranian forces weren't a threat to it. Um, and one of the ways of doing that was by pouring all this money into, uh, especially Syria, where it thought that it could fight a, a proxy war, especially against Iran. And as I said also, 
to cut across the Arab Revolution. But the, the, the point is also that Saudi Arabia was probably the biggest loser coming out of the Syrian civil war. Not only did it not achieve anything, but its mortal enemy, existential threat that it faces from Iran, has never been stronger in, in Syria. Iranian influence has never been bigger in, in, in Syria. And that's a very um, heavy defeat for, 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 for Saudi Arabia. Um, it tried to make up for that by going to war with Yemen, trying to assert itself, showing who, you know, who's the boss here, basically. This defenseless, poor country of, I think it's 15 or 13 million inhabitants. Sorry, it's, maybe it's 20. Uh, the, the poorest country in the Arab world. And Saudi Arabia is basically carpet bombing it for the past three years, leaving 7 million people on the edge of starvation, killing you know, thousands of people, displacing hundreds of thousands of people. And yet, it's nowhere near winning. It's nowhere near achieving any of the objectives that it, that it set itself. In fact, just recently, there was an internal coup within his camp and separatist forces, which are linked to the Emirates, which used to be the closest ally of Saudi Arabia, basically took power and cut out the Saudis in all the areas that they control. And now the Saudi-supported Saudi proxies are just confined to ruling the front line, basically, between themselves and the Houthis and, and, and nothing else. It's basically a mess. And there's no way they can win. That, that war is unwinnable for them. Um, then they tried to assert themselves against Qatar. I don't know if you, you remember, but uh, before the summer, there was a clash between Saudi Arabia and Qatar. And the reason is, again, because of all these developments happening, because of this loosening of the structures that we kind of built before, Qatar has started to play a more independent role in the region. It's built up uh, Al Jazeera, which intervenes politically in every single country, tried to whip up mass movements, support its own, uh, own agenda. Um, it's been dealing with Iran and Turkey, for instance, which are, again, enemies in terms of uh, well, yeah, opposing forces to, to, to Saudi Arabia. And the Saudis in the summer, supported by Donald Trump, said, uh, well, look, we're going to draw a line, and anyone who's not with us are against us. And they imposed these heavy sanctions on Qatar, closing off any kind of basically trade and, and relationship with Qatar. And they thought they were going to break the, the Qataris in a few days. I think they, they gave them a like four-day deadline, and then they extended it to a week. And, then a bit, and it's, the, the, the sanctions are still ongoing, but the Qataris didn't care really. And what's the result? They haven't achieved anything. In fact, the Qataris increased their ties with the Iranians, increased trade ties with the Iranians, increased uh, military ties with, with the Turks. And, um, and, you know, Donald Trump, of course, being, you know, he's not Obama, he sticks by the allies of, the, of U.S. imperialism. At, in, the, in the beginning, he supported Saudi Arabia against Qatar. Uh, he said, well, we, we're with it. But then someone reminded him, oh, by the way, our biggest military base in the Middle East is in Qatar. And then he had to withdraw immediately and kind of try to patch things up. And so he didn't back, the, back Saudi Arabia, in effect. Why? Because it wasn't in the interests of the, of the U.S. ruling class. And that's the general situation that we've seen uh, with the U.S. in relation to Saudi Arabia, that in Qatar it didn't support uh, the, the, the kingdom. In Syria, in fact, Donald Trump has basically made a deal or is making, trying to make a deal with Russia, cutting out the Saudi proxies and Saudi influence. In Yemen... Trump is very determined to pull out of Yemen. The American ruling class is very opposed, although they, they do participate, of course, and they're not too good for that. But, uh, but they're very opposed to that. Uh, in Iraq, the Americans are still cooperating with Iranian-supported forces. In Lebanon, again, Saudis tried to whip up a crisis just recently, a few months ago, and the Americans opposed them. Um, which is obvious because at this stage, that doesn't suit the interests of the U.S. ruling class, which, as I said, is not as strong as it used to be. And what this reveals is a deep, deep crisis of Saudi Arabia itself because this is, Saudi Arabia is not the result of a you know, national liberation movement or national bourgeois revolution coming from below. It's an artificial formation which, if it had been left to itself, would have probably collapsed uh, a few years or a very short time after its inception, um, it's not a real nation state. This, this, it's a state comp composed of let me just, six different forces which are all opposed to each other. So there's the royal family and the, you know, the immediate, well, immediate, there's a lot of them, but there's, there's the royal family which have their own kind of interest and then uh, which 
you know, which are hated by everyone in effect because they live these degenerate, you know, disgusting lives with sex slaves, drinking, drugs, killing, murdering, oh, the most disgusting things you can find, you can, you can think of uh, at all. And then on the other side, their closest allies is the Wahhabi establishment, the clerical establishment, who they made a deal with. And the Wahhabis basically uh, agreed to have these people as kings and ruling society and the economy, whereas the Wahhabis would dominate the ideological side of things. So the mosques, the universities, the curriculum, every, everything that has with ideology to do, these people are doing it. But that in itself is a fundamental contradiction because Wahhabi Islam preaches, you know, it's, it's basically the same ideology as ISIS and Al-Qaeda and these people. And they want a caliphate. And especially in a country where, where Mecca is placed, there should be a caliph and there shouldn't be a king. There shouldn't be a monarchy. And certainly not these kings and, and, and princes and princesses who live anything by the book uh, of, of, of the Quran, basically. So that in itself is a constantly reoccurring crisis that, that the royals have been overcome by basically sending the Wahhabis out to do the dirty work in Afghanistan, in Syria now, in Yemen, and all these places where they send the, the Islamists in collaboration with, with, the, with the Americans. Then there's the clans. Each of, there's, there's a whole myriad of clans the royal family is married into, but they all have their own interests. And they, yeah, they, they're basically dependent on a network of patronage, basically, of, of receiving money coming from, from above. There's the Shia minority, which is 20% of the population, living in all the areas where the, uh, where the oil is, basically. They're vilified every single day in the news, in the schools, they, they, uh, and basically treated like outcasts and not really real humans. They obviously hate the regime. Uh, and they form the majority on, in the oil-rich regions. There, there's the youth, which has also had enough of this disgusting, you know, this hypocritical regime. And then there's obviously the working class, which is not Saudi at all, which is all imported workers, basically, guest workers, who are also treated as, like slaves, and uh, there's millions of them, and they have no illusions and no uh, uh, kind of attachment to, to the regime. So you have all these six forces pulling in each their own directions. None of them are interested, or almost none of them are interested in uh, having in common interests. And the only way you could keep this kingdom together, this area together, was by one, oil money, tons of oil money, and secondly, by support, uh, by being a part of the umbrella of British first and then U.S. imperialism later on because of the, the role they played in, in supplying the U.S. with oil and also the political role of supporting political Islam and this, the conservative reactionary ideologies throughout the, the, the region working against revolutionary movements and so on. But now all of that is gone because the U.S., first of all, is self-sufficient in oil, more, more or less. I think the U.S. is sometimes the, most, the biggest oil producer of the world because of this whole shale uh, oil uh, business. And, um, and also from a political point of view, the, the, the actions of the Saudis, like what they're doing in Yemen or what they did in Syria once the U.S. had pulled back, is becoming, for, from a point of view of a big section of the U.S. ruling class, is more a liability than an ally, in fact. And it's seen as, as, as a problem. Um, and therefore, you see this uh, uh, along, with the, sorry, along with the decline of oil prices, which is connected to the, to the world economic crisis, means that they cannot pay these the, the people, basically. They cannot pay to keep people employed. You see unemployment. You see aus beginnings of austerity. And therefore, you see the beginnings of the falling apart of this whole very delicately balanced uh, network. Um, and the purges that we see, you know, there have been series of waves of purges in the Saudi uh, ruling class. Uh, there was an anti-corruption campaign where a whole layer was arrested and then they could pay them their way out of prison, which is interesting coming from you know, an anti-corruption uh, campaign, obviously. Um, and all of that is what is the beginnings of the outlines of, a, of the future civil war, essentially. It's the beginnings of a breakup of, of the Saudi uh, regime. They can no longer buy social peace. And the, the, the new crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, he's trying to kind of you know, tilting from one side to another, trying to appease all these forces, but is the, the, he cannot appease all of them at once. He went into Yemen in order to appease the Wahhabis and the, the conservative layers, the reactionary layers, and what's happening, they're, they're losing, and also they've just been even more strengthened. Al-Qaeda is more strong, and they're more determined to overthrow the, the, the kingdom. Then he tries to open up slightly uh, the democratic avenues 
you know, now you can see the uh, emoji movie in Saudi Arabia, which is a very big step forward. Um, but it was, it's the first cinemas that have opened up. And it's trying to give these very mild democratic reforms, which are, in fact, nothing. I mean, there's no democracy in Saudi Arabia in spite of what, what, what we're told by New York Times and such. Um, but that is causing a reaction amongst the, 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 the reactionaries. And every side that he tries to lean on is just going to kind of cause opposition from the other one. And in the end, um, I think what we're seeing is basically a wounded, a deadly wounded animal hemorrhaging, but which is also the place where it's more uh, lethal than ever before. Uh, going into war in Syria, going into war in Yemen, beginning these adventures, these crazy desperate adventures basically, but which all basically uh, bring out the, the real general process, which is a decline and fragmentation, gradual decline and fragmentation of Saudi Arabia, uh, and in its place, in the region, the rise of Iran and Turkey, which are the only, along with uh, probably, um, well, which are, which are real nation states and which have a strong industrial base as opposed to, 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 to Saudi Arabia. Um, another element of this breakup of, the, of the, the order of the region and the loosening of the grip of, of, of different powers is the rise of the national question and especially the, the Kurdish question. Now, when the Syrian revolution started, Assad couldn't face all sides at once. And therefore, he basically made a deal with the Kurdish leaders saying, look, we're going to pull out of the northeastern areas and focus on cracking down on the movement in the west. And they kind of had an agreement that they, would, that they, would, um, they wouldn't go to war with each other in the beginning. Now, this vacuum of power was filled by the PYD or basically a sister organization of the, the, the Turkish-based Kurdish group, the PKK. Um, and its militia, which is called the YPG, I think everyone knows. And that was the beginning of the, 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 the Rojava revolution, that the, the Kurds for the first time, basically, because of the general revolution sweeping the, the, the area, became masters of their own land. And they set up these very democratic organs of power, they uh, set up this People's Army, basically, the YPG, which quickly became the most efficient army in the region. Why? Because they were fighting for their own homeland. And on the basis of a non-sectarian approach, on the basis of a democratic approach, uh, they could, first of all, they were fear, fear, uh, fearless fighters. They didn't need like, drugs like many other uh, militias need in, at, at the same amount, anyway. And uh, because they had a cause they were fighting for, and they were willing to lose, uh, to give up their lives for it. And at the same time, they could appeal to the peoples in the areas that, that they moved in, because they were non-sectarian and, and, and democratic. Um, now, this gave them enormous authority throughout the region, in Iraq, amongst, I mean, first of all, all youth throughout the region, just, well, much more than in the West, probably, were looking towards this... Uh, this democratic experiment, you can say, or are looking towards it, as the most progressive thing throughout anywhere. There's nothing more democratic, basically, than, than what's going on in northern, northern Syria. But especially amongst Kurdish youth in Iraq and in Turkey, this became a focal point. And inside Turkey, this coincided with the rise of the class struggle, which also meant that, saw the rise of this party called the HCP. The HCP is kind of dominated or heavily influenced by the PKK, but it's a broader movement than that. Um, and, um, but it was for the first time a movement which united the Kurdish and Turkish workers and youth, radical workers and youth. And on this basis, for the first time since the 70s, you saw a united struggle of the working class across all these national divides in, 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 in Turkey. Uh, on the basis of a radical rhetoric and a democratic rhetoric against uh, the Erdogan regime, and it managed to get into parliament with 13.5% of the vote, which was a surprise to everyone, um, and basically block Erdogan's uh, dis different designs for, taking, for consolidating and concentrating powers in his own hand. And immediately, the Kurdish movement became a threat, an existential threat against the Erdogan regime, because the 13.5% was just the most radicalized people. There were a far bigger movement inside Turkey who were looking to that movement, seeing, you know, trying to see where is it going, 
uh, as an alternative to fight against the uh, Erdogan, which the Republican Party, so-called Social Demo Democratic Party, CHP, is completely incapable of doing. Um, now, it also became, in Iraq, the, the PKK became a threat because its influence was rising, and the, uh, the Barzani's puppet regime, sorry, Erdogan's <coughs> puppet Barzani was actually basically coming under threat from, from the rising uh, influence of the, of the PKK. And in Syria, not only did the PKK get, gain a, you know, a big chunk of land bordering on Turkey, but they were also the, fierce, the best fighters against Turkey's proxies, ISIS and, and other jihadist organizations. Um, uh, and also physically, if you look at, at there was at one point that the PKK controlled the whole southern border of Turkey, basically from the Iranian border all the way, almost all the way towards the Mediterranean, except for a tiny, two tiny bits of, of, of land. So obviously that was a threat to all the plans and designs of, of Erdogan, both internally and, and externally. Um, and that's why he began this brutal anti-Kurdish civil war, basically. He's trying to whip up uh, 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 sectarianism, nationalism, in order to cut across the, 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 the class struggle internally in, in, in Turkey, but also obviously to fight and to try to degrade uh, the Kurds uh, in their own areas. Um, now that's the basis of what we see today, the, 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 the brutal attack against Afrin. And we have to say, it's interesting that the West is so uh, worried about what's going on in eastern Ghouta, in, 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 just in, in Damascus, where their own is Islamist proxies are being, uh, are being defeated. And yet you have this completely defenseless forces in Afrin, the Kurds in Afrin, who are being brutally massacred by their own ally, and no one is, more or less, no one is talking about it, except for a little couple of days in the beginning of it. Um, that just shows to what extent the democratic values of, of, of Western leaders uh, go. Um, but also it shows that the Kurds who've been, you know, the Kurdish leaders developed this idea that they could work with different powers and use the divisions between them to their own benefit. So they would work with the Americans against the Turks and against the Iranians and, and, and so on. And they invited the Russian forces in. In some areas they invited Assad forces in against the Turks. And some areas obviously now they had the Americans. But this whole thing with Afrin really reveals that all of these powers have united to look the other, the other way while Erdogan is massacring the Kurds. Because for them the Kurds don't mean anything. They're just small change in, in their little games. And the only way uh, that the Kurdish struggle can advance it by, is by leaning on the two uh, methods that worked to begin with. One was in Syria. What was that, what was that work? It was an all Syrian revolution which caused a vacuum in, in their areas. That's what weakened the Assad regime so the Kurds could take power essentially. Or in Turkey, where class based, not a Kurdish, uh, only Kurdish uh, uh, movement, but a class based movement across the different nationalities against the regime. That's what caused, that's what helped the, the, the Kurdish movement to rise. And it shows that that's what they can lean on. They can, they can only lean on the oppressed and poor uh, masses of the region in the struggle against uh, imperialism and not different imperialist forces because at the end of the day, they don't mean anything for them. Uh, the, Turkey is a nuclear force, has the biggest industry uh, throughout the region. Of course, the U.S. are not going to uh, are not going to abandon Turkey because of uh, the Kurds, who, for their point of view, is just a barren l piece of land, has no strategic or economic, uh, in the long term, um, value. Uh, and in fact, in, inside Turkey, there is a, a, a chance for that because inside Turkey, the class struggle is heating up. Um, and this is, in fact, why you see increasingly... Uh, how do you say, uh, violent uh, twists and turns by Erdogan itself. Erdogan came to power with the collapse of the, uh, basically the collapse of the established political parties in Turkey, uh, of the CHP and all the, the different Kemalist forces, basically collapsing because of years of corruption and you know, the very chaotic rule, mismanagement and so on. And Erdogan could kind of rise up and say, oh, I'm the democratic, I have clean hands, I'm a pious, thanks, it's going to be it. A little more. <laughs> I'm a pious Muslim, and you know I care about people, and um, and this all felt 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 kind of a, it happened at the same time as there was a massive boom, uh, economic boom on an international level, uh, 
which meant that the Turkish economy increased five, six-fold over the past 15, 20 years. Now, obviously, for a big part of the Turkish society, especially the Anatolian masses, which were Erdogan's base, that, that was a huge, although they didn't gain proportionally a big size of this, uh, this uh, increase in, in GDP and economic growth, but their lives did improve four or five times, right? So they went to basically living in, the most, living in the most backward, you know, very, very primitive situation in, in villages and so on in, in, in Anatolia to, being, to living in modern cities, industrialized cities, having cars, houses, and, and, and so on. Now, as long as that boom was taking place, all was good. But from 2011 onwards, you begin to see this kind of, uh, the, the economic boom flattening out, and also Erdogan having to do more and more stunts in order to keep it up, pushing um, uh, credit into society. Like, so Turkey used to be a very saving society. Like, everyone had the savings. But now it's filled with debt. Everyone has debt up to here, just like Europe did. Well, it still has, but just like before the, the, the crash in 2008 in, 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 in Europe. Um, now, that is the big, so therefore you also see the beginnings of the intensification of the, of the working class, uh, of the class struggle. The beginnings of especially this new Anatolian working class, you have 22% of the population becoming working class over the past 20 years, beginning to break free and see the, you know, break free of the illusions of the past that, oh, them and the bosses, there was just this, you know, natural relations, symbiotic relationship, everyone would benefit, basically. But now you see the intensification of, of, of this struggle in the Anatolian uh, areas and in Erdogan's strongholds, basically. And at the same time, in the places where he wasn't, it, he didn't have a stronghold, in, in, in the western areas, where the uh, Republicans and the uh, you know, secular parties were, were, were stronger. And therefore, he needs all of these. He needs the, the anti-Kurdish hysteria. He needs the wars... He cannot be defeated in any of these projects because any one of those defeats would immediately feed in to the internal social and political and economic crisis and, and unravel the whole thing. So therefore, for the, from the point of view of the Kurdish masses and the, and the revolutionary movements, this, is an, this, is a, this could potentially be a good situation. Obviously, not right now where anti-Kurdish hysteria is at, at its top, but the beginnings, the outlines of the future class struggle is there and, uh, and, um, and will uh, destabilize the, the regime again, and, and you will see the rise of movements again in Turkey, just like you saw the, you know, the first glimpses of it in the Gezi Park movement in 2013. And then, I know this, uh, it's been a long talk, but then also finally you have the situation in Iran. Now, Iran... On paper, if you look at it from, from afar, I don't go into sight, you have the rising power, the rising military power of the Middle East, basically. You're having hundreds of thousands of militiamen in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, you know, basically controlling land from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean, they like to boast about. And there's no other force militarily, actually, on the ground which can challenge Iran in, in those areas. But uh, the, the, the Iranian regime itself is a completely corroded degenerate and sclerotic regime in, in, in effect. It's very rotten. Iranian capitalism has proven completely incapable of developing society. Forty years of these mullahs, basically, the, the, the theocracy in power. And what have, people, what have people gained? In fact, a lot of people say, well, we're worse off than, than we were before. And they see they've been you know, giving up everything, you know, step by step, giving up the livelihoods, the everything they had in order to fight against uh, the U.S., fight against this or that, hold on, hold their breath, while the mullahs and the ruling class live, you know, these very, again, very degenerate lives uh, in, in, in opulence. Is that, that's what it's called, isn't it? <laughs> um, inequality has been constantly on the rise. Obviously, at the same time, we have corruption, lack of dictatorship. This is a complete suffocating and, uh, 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 environment. And you saw the beginnings of, uh, well, in 2009, you saw a big movement coming up. But because it didn't connect to the working class, it, it kind of receded again. But now, in the beginning of this year, you saw probably the most uh, dangerous, from the point of view of the regime, the most dangerous movement it's seen since uh, the beginning of the revolution. Although, in numerical uh, terms, it was quite small. It was only about, um, I think that's my phone. <laughs> 
is it? No, no, no. In numerical terms, it was a, a relatively small movement of 40,000 people in total. But it was spread across all layers, all areas of, uh, of, of Iran, sorry. And it was mainly on the basis of the, the most poor, oppressed, working class layers, uh, middle, lower middle class layers, farmers. So these layers, in fact, a lot of them were traditionally seen as the base of, of the social base of the regime. Um, and in fact, the, the, the initial movement which sparked it was kind of allowed to take place by one of the most conservative clerics in the city of Mashhad, which is the second largest city of Iran, in order to attack the, 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 the government, which is, you know, the, is, is a more liberal government. And he wanted to use that basically as a populist measure to strike blows against his own political opponents. But it immediately spun out of control, and the, the slogans which came out were extremely radical. And not only did they you know, attack uh, the government, they attacked all the, the whole regime, Khamenei, and even there were instances of people burning pictures of Khomeini and just denouncing the whole regime. These people who were from the most religious, conservative, uh, you know, stagnant in social terms and in political terms, layers for, for many, many years, they've never been into any struggle, never been involved in political activities, suddenly burst out because this, you know, they just basically had it, had it of poverty and of, 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 of you know, a lack of any perspective for a decent or tolerable future, basically. Um, and, um, and the regime was completely taken aback. It was incapable of doing anything against this movement. It, it, it tried to, in fact, although it did try, you know, there were certain clashes, but the regime was very afraid of cracking down heavily, arresting too many people, because why it would probably, because this whole thing reflected a much more deep-seated uh, anger. And of course, this movement couldn't last for, many, for, for long. After, I think after two weeks, approximately 14, 15 days, it kind of died down because it wasn't organized, didn't have a perspective, what are we going to achieve? Didn't have anything really a focal point, uh, but nevertheless, nothing was solved. And in fact, uh, the, the 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 effects that it had was first of all, all the austerity measures that have been announced in the in this year's budget were withdrawn. Uh, there was an opening of the space for demonstrations and protests to take place, and there was a big discussion, open discussion, amongst by all factions, which you know, who would reiterate that, oh, of course, we have a right for peaceful protests, and this is Iran, this is a, this is a dictatorship essentially, where peaceful protest has never been a guaranteed right for for for, for anyone, and this reveals that the regime is terrified of what what is happening now, and in fact. Uh, around the anniversary of the revolution, so that's a bit more than a month ago, President Rouhani came out and he said, um, this is something that's been echoed in many, many places, he said, look, the previous regime didn't realize that it needed to reform, and it, was, and it only started to reform when it could see a revolution, i.e. It, it, it only began to reform when it was too late for it. And it was, he was basically warning the establishment and the regime that we have to reform, we have to open up we have to you know, allow some breathing space for people in order to uh, to avert, I give concessions from above to avert a revolution from below. Now, that is of course true, but the point is also that the other wing of the regime is saying, well, no, no, we need to crack down because if we open up, you're going to have a surge of, 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 of anger and then you're going to have a revolution. We're going to crack down in order to, uh, to avoid a revolution. And I think both of them are correct because... The, the, the process has reached such a stage that decades and decades of deprivation, basically, in, in every single field uh, of society has left the people full of resentment and anger and problems which the regime cannot solve. The lack of wages, you know, the, the Iranian workers have basically lost out 10 to 25 percent of the wages, you know, being cut down, being undercut by, undermined by inflation for the past 10 or 15 years, every single year. So in order to catch up with just the position they had 10 years ago, it did an enormous rise in, in, in wages. And the Iranian economy does not have that. Iranian capitalism cannot solve that because Iranian capitalism is a very parasitic form of capitalism, basically organized around sucking profit out of oil money. Uh, uh, essentially nothing else. Um, 
So they cannot, they cannot satisfy the needs of the masses. And that's why you see the situation where the masses are becoming emboldened, they're more confident, and you've seen since the ebbing, that ebbing out of that movement, you've seen a steady trickle of new protests coming every single day. Today, sorry, on Sunday, it was a, a big protest outside Tehran University against uh, students being, uh, being detained and, and imprisoned for political activity. There's been a, a, a whole, you know, thousands of farmers in Isfahan in central Iran have been protesting for more than 20 days every single day against um, uh, uh, basically mismanagement of the water supply, which has left Iran more or less dry. There's a massive drought in Iran now. And this is undermining the base, basic, uh, you know, uh, existence of, 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 of these farmers. In southern Iran, in Ahvaz, in southwestern Iran, you've had uh, thousands of metal workers striking again for, for two or two, three weeks now uh, against unpaid wages. Every single day you have strikes, different protests just springing up here and there. And the more people see that we're, we're more people, in fact, who feel the same way, and the more they see that the regime is not reacting, is, it cannot react. Because if it cracks down, if it, it risks a bigger uh, movement. Uh, the more will this movement um, increase. Now, it might die down for now, there might be ups and downs, but in my opinion, what we see is the beginnings of a revolutionary process taking place in Iran as well. And the only thing the Iranian the regime has working for it is the foreign threat, is the role that it's playing in the region against US imperialism, against uh, Islamic fundamentalism and, and these things. It tries to portray itself as a defender of democracy and non-sectarianism in the region, uh, fighting against the US. But also that has a limit. Uh, and, but it also shows that that is part of the driving force between you know, of what you know, the, driving the, what it's doing in Iraq and Syria and Lebanon and uh, Yemen and, and elsewhere. It's one of the few kind of successes it can it can use to rally the, the, the people around. So this is uh, I mean there's, there's much more to say about the Middle East, but this is a general situation you see. Uh, all of this, the whole process is essentially the process of, of the crisis of capitalism. This system, the capitalism came to power in Europe, uh, uh, was developed in Europe, fighting, you know, uh, during the Enlightenment, fighting for, against obscurantism, against mysticism, for modernization, for uh, wiping the state clean and removing backwardness, basically, as a precondition for its development. But by the time capitalism reached, capitalism reached uh, the Middle East and the Arab world, it already degenerated and rotten. And in fact, it's played the exact opposite role. The only forces keeping up obscurantism, Islamic funda fundamentalism, all this reactionary uh, you know, garbage that you basically see, human waste, the only forces keeping them up is billions and billions of dollars coming from Western imperialism, uh, mainly, and from their puppets, from the backward puppets, living in the region, all the progressive classes, uh, whenever all the modern classes, you can see, even, even big layers of the capitalist classes or, or the, the, the upper middle classes, whenever they begin to move, uh, they, they immediately come into conflict with the basic, with, with capitalism essentially, and, and can only overcome, can only modernize uh, society if they Pass, you know, pass over the, 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 that stage, essentially, going, moving towards a, a socialist society. And the only people who are willing to defend capitalism, the interests of, of the imperialists, are these classes, these layers that they find, which are from prehistoric, pre-capitalist, uh, kind of medieval, feudal uh, eras, tribal forces, um, you know, the, the most downtrodden, lumpen elements, who've lost everything, who've been completely crushed by the system itself, don't have anything to to the, the same type of forces, you could say that in, in, in the 30s were the basis of fascism in, in, in Europe. The, the, the classes who don't belong basically to, 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 to the modern era, those are the only ones that the bourgeoisie can rely on. And at the same time, there's the other much bigger, much more important movement, which is the rise of the mass movements of, of, the, of the working class, of the working masses of, of, uh, and of the youth, who are beginning to take their first steps against this, this, this system. Firstly, unconsciously, because they, you know, they, they, can, they don't know what they want, but they, don't know, they certainly know they cannot have any, any more of this. But gradually we will see, and we are seeing, a radicalization of this, that through their own experiences, people are moving to the left, 
and the traditions, the real traditions, political traditions of the Middle East, which are socialism and communism, those are the only real mass movements which have ever existed in the Middle East on their own uh, kind of accord, on their own, on, based on their own forces. Um, or oh, merit, sorry. Uh, they're, they're being uh, revived. Uh, and that is the, 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 the future of, of, of the region, if, if you may. The, the clash, on the one hand, between revolution uh, which will move to, uh, towards uh, the socialist transformation of society and on counter-revolution reaction and barbarism which is which is what try to keep this this old society um uh, degenerate society in place yeah, I did that. Thanks.